which driver progresses the most throughout the races. Hello, my name is Alex Does F1 Stuff and welcome finally to part number four of my video series determining the best driver of 2020. And today we are looking at which driver progresses the most through the races. Now, if you have not seen parts one, two, and three, I'll pop a link to the playlist in the corner where I've given ranks on numerous different categories throughout their qualifying performances, their race performances, their progression through practice and qualifying. And now part four, we're looking at their progression through the race. And for that qualifying video, we looked at seven different categories based off of your performance against your teammate and your own individual performance as well, based on your average race perform or your average qualifying position, your uh, consistency as well, and things like that. We ranked those and then we averaged those seven ranks out as well. In the race one, we looked at eight categories and did exactly the same, both individual performances and performances against your teammate. Then in the uh, driver progression throughout the weekend, we looked at, I think it was just over 200, 200. 21 different categories or something like that and again based off of individual performances and performances against your teammate ranked all of those to give an overall ranking and today today we've gone from 7 to 8 to 221 and we are now looking at 1975 different categories but also like the previous video part number three, the first section of this video isn't particularly necessary. So if you would like to skip straight to the rankings, please by all means go ahead and skip there where I explain how I have ranked each of the drivers and then get into the rankings. But if you want to sit through all of this data, we're going to look at position charts and also lap time charts as well and sort of analyze what happens during the races in those laps. So if you like that kind of data, please do stick around as we'll be talking through each and every one of the races. So without further ado, we will begin in Austria, round number one, and we pull up their positions chart, and we can see slowly filling in everyone's positions. Now, it's all a little bit hectic, to be honest. We've got Verstappen that ends up retiring, falling down to position 20, a massive steep line. We've got the Ferraris filling themselves in, the Alfa Tauris, the Alfa Romeos as well, and you can see a slow progression downwards as we lose more and more finishes. So this is what your average positions chart ends up looking like. We see that Valtteri Bottas, the turquoise with the black dot line, had a nice un un uninterrupted lead to the end of the race. Now, unfortunately, positions charts don't always show every single overtake, because lots of overtakes can happen on different laps, and also these aren't necessarily on-track overtakes, these more show the pit stops and things like that. When someone comes into a pit, they have a big, nice, steep, incline or decline in their position and then they will continue forwards and come back down the order again mainly through pit stops but of course this can show uh, position changes throughout the lap so for example lap 32 to 33 we've got uh, Lando Norris and Sergio Perez swapping positions but if we just take a look now at the Austria lap chart we see that it's a little bit different now I will apologize right away for the two big voids that are in these graphs that is 100% my mistake. So I pinch most of my data from an API website, I pop it into my own database and I do my own number crunching with it. However, I copied this data over and I thought, right, I know for this video, I don't want to be looking at safety car laps because it's gonna affect the data at the end of this video. So I deleted the safety car laps and any laps under VSC and things like that. The pointless laps where the pace doesn't really mean anything. And then it wasn't until I got round to finishing all of the data tables and then creating the graphs that I thought, oh, no, I've, I've blanked it. It's now going to have voids like it does here. However, I deleted the contents from my main database table, not a copy of my database table. And because it doesn't impact upon the overall rankings of the video, I was far too lazy to go and re-grab all of the data again because it doesn't impact on the video. Unfortunately, we will have these voids, but for some races, there are no voids as there were no VSCs or safety cars. So for some, we will actually see everything, but equally, we don't really need to see the safety car lines. Now, unfortunately, Austria is a little bit boring and not a great deal happens. So we will move on into Styria and we begin with their positions chart and we fill everybody in and we can see that not a lot happens until the middle portion of the race. And then again, not a lot happens. There is a big mangle mess of people swapping places all over the place in the middle portion of 
Styria. And then, of course, we have on the very far right-hand side, lap 70 to 71, we have the position change of the McLarens, Renaults, and racing points due to Sergio Perez's little issue, where we had three cars crossing the line side by side. But now, if I actually head on in to the lap chart, we can see a lot more detail. So I'm going to highlight a few things on this graph. The first box is the initial pit stops, the, what I'm going to class as the early pit stops. They're highlighted in green, and we can see people slowing down here for that stop. And then in blue, we have the main bulk of pit stops, the first group. And then we have the latter performances, or the latter pit stops here in yellow. Now these are what I call the alternate strategy pit stops and they basically some of them are the second pit stops of the people in green but then also they could be a slightly different pit stop as well. And then all the way on the far right hand side we have what I call the fastest lap pit stops as both these drivers Max Verstappen and also Carlos Sainz pitted at the very end of the race to head towards the fastest lap and you can see them both go below Again, what I sort of call the rope is the main bulk of everybody's lap times going horizontally. They poke below that and Carlos Sainz ends up with the fastest lap. But very importantly to note, and this is a trend that we see throughout most of the races, is this chasm here. And we can follow it and trace it pretty much until about the two thirds line of this race. And it is the performance gap between the two Mercedes and Max Verstappen and the rest of the field. Now what exactly does this look like up close? So I can zoom in on that particular lap chart. We're now looking at a range of just six seconds. So we can see Carlos Sainz's fastest lap and Max Verstappen's fastest lap on the far right hand side and then we can really clearly see that performance gap especially in the first half, maybe first two thirds of the race between the two Mercedes and Max Verstappen and everybody else. And this is basically how we're going to run through the whole races. We're going to look at the positions chart and see what happens there. We're then going to look at the race lap chart as well. We're going to highlight the pit stops and highlight any odd things. And then we will zoom on in and have a look at that nice little chasm that is formed by the pace difference between Mercedes and everybody else. And so we then move on in to Hungary and we begin with their positions chart, which is a awful mess at the very opening gambit of this race. And then it just sort of peters into nothing. A little bit of changing here in the middle, and then practically nothing at the end of this race, but all of the action happens at the very, very start. And if we just have a look at their lap time charts, we can see it clearly here. Now, unfortunately, this data is massively skewed because of Nicholas Latifi's almost or just over three minute lap time on lap five. I have no idea what went on there. So if I just instantly exclude his lap five, we can see what really went on. And again, highlighting in green, this is the first bulk pit stops. Everybody pitted on the first lap and you can see everyone speeding up as well to join the nice big thick rope. We then have the first group of normal pit stops. We then have a large group in the middle as well. And then we've got the alternate pit stops all the way here on the right. And then we have just one fastest lap pit stop coming from Lewis Hamilton as well, which he does manage to achieve that fastest lap. And then just highlighting the chasm, if any of you can actually see it, it is just here and it runs near enough to the first quarter of this race and then it sort of gets lost just around this point here, lap 21. And then possibly the chasm comes back just around this point here at about lap 63 to 64. I wouldn't really class that one as a chasm. Definitely the first one highlighted is, but I wouldn't necessarily count that one as a chasm, no. And then zooming in on this chart, we can see that chasm clearly in the first opening portion of this race. And then also Valtteri Bottas had some nice performance uh, charges, really. He was massively faster than a lot of people for a large chunk of this race in the latter stages. But unfortunately, it just wasn't quite enough to catch up to Lewis Hamilton at the very end. And then we move on into Great Britain and we have the positions chart here. Now this was an extremely boring one. Not a great deal happened in Great Britain at all. We can see a couple pit stops and a couple things like that. And then of course, at the very, very end on the far right hand side, we have Valtteri Bottas and Carlos Sainz having their tire issues and both drivers storming up in those positions as well. But if we just take a look at the lap time chart, unfortunately, I've got the voids again. It's a little bit annoying, but we can clearly again see this chasm that runs throughout this void as well and back along here. We do have Alex Albon actually popping into this one as well, but it is still both Mercedes and Max Verstappen as well. And this runs 
pretty much the full length of the race. And zooming in on this, we can see it so very clearly. And actually, after Alex Albon's probably second pit stop, I think, after the safety car that unfortunately is a little bit of a void, you can see he is equal and in some cases much, much quicker than everybody else in the latter stages of the British Grand Prix. But then switching it on over to the 70th anniversary Grand Prix, we have a positions chart that is a little bit more hectic. Considering it's the same track and just one week later with slightly different tyre compounds, we have a track that looks, or chart sorry, that looks completely, completely different. And then just moving down towards the lap time chart, you can see why. We have so many pit stops all throughout this race. So we have the first set of pit stops here. Then we have a second group just here. And then I've kind of grouped this as one massive one in the middle. You could argue that this can even be split up into perhaps three different groups of pit stops, but I've decided to class it as just one. We then have a third group of blue highlighted pit stops as well. Then finally, we've got the alternate pit stops and probably those second ones from the green box as well. And then we have the latter stage pit stops and the fastest lap pit stops as well. And just highlighting the chasm, we can sort of see a little bit just at the end here and also at the very beginning here. But throughout the main portion of this race, there wasn't really one. It only really started very well at the beginning and then ended very strongly. There wasn't really one throughout the rest of this Grand Prix. And zooming in, yeah, you can't really see it. You can definitely see it from laps one to about laps five and then definitely from laps 40 to the end. But throughout then, it's just a jumbled mess of lines. And now we head to Spain. Now Spain's position chart is again, very, very boring. Not a lot happens until the pit stop stages. And then after all of the pit stops, not a lot happens. I mean, just look at that first portion of the, of the positions chart. Up until about lap 17, there's only three changes of position. That is just incredibly boring, right up until all of the pit stops in the uh, middle portion of this race. And having a look at the lap time chart, we can see it here. We do have an abnormally high, just over two minute lap time from, I believe that is Charles Leclerc after his engine issue. And then he went around the track without his seatbelt on. But if we just highlight the sections of pit stops, we've got the first group here, then we've got the second group. And then of course, we've got that big group in the middle, including Charles Leclerc's issue with his over two minute lap time. We then have a third group of blue box pit stops. Then we've got the alternate pit stops as well, and probably the second ones from the green box. And then finally, we have the fastest lap pit stops all the way on the right. And then we definitely, definitely have a chasm in this race running pretty much the whole length of this race, very clear from laps 10 to laps 20, and then it reappears from about laps 39 up to where the arrow ends at lap 59. And then just zooming in on this section, just to have a clearer look at this, we can see it so, so very clearly. It is absolutely enormous, this pace difference from everybody else compared to Mercedes and especially Verstappen. It's just ludicrous how much of a pace difference they had in this race. And at the widest part of this chasm, laps 13 to 14, for Lewis Hamilton, he was two seconds faster than the people behind him in the midfield. That is just absolutely crazy. And to maintain that, and to maintain that pace difference throughout the whole race, that is absolutely ludicrous. But we head on into Belgium now, a little bit more of an ordinary positions chart. Again, not a lot happens in this one. We see a couple pit stops from uh, Sergio Perez and also... Uh, who's the black, I think that's Pierre Gasly, actually in the Alpha Tori. But interestingly, in their steep incline, they have a position dot in the middle, which kind of suggests to me that when they go into the pits, they pass the start finish line, they then stop for their pit stop, and then they leave again. But because they've crossed the position line, it records their position where they enter the pit stops, having to slow down, hit the pit limiter, they lose positions, cross the line, it registers that slow decline, then they stop and they're stationary for 20 odd seconds and come out and lose even more positions. But interestingly, if we look at Sergio Perez, he actually has two position dots. So over the course of three laps, he lost an enormous amount of positions, which possibly is indicative of two pit stops in a row. But if we look at the uh, lap time chart, that didn't happen. Yes, we've got a big void in the middle of the race, which unfortunately there was a small safety car or VSC period, which is a little bit annoying. So I can't be highlighting any pit stops as there aren't really many visible here. But there is absolutely 
a chasm between the performance differential from everybody else to the two Mercedes that lasts for about three quarters of the race distance. And then just zooming in on this chasm here, we can see it very, very clearly. Unfortunately, we do have that void, but you can sort of just connect the dots really, and the chasm definitely stays there. But it's just absolutely ridiculous to see how far ahead they are, especially in the early portions of the race when everyone is full of fuel. That is when they seem to have the biggest advantage because it sort of disappears when everyone burns off all their fuel and they're going a little bit quicker. But perhaps that's because they have such an advantage over everybody else that they slow their engines down, whereas everybody else is still fighting to the very, very end. But interestingly to note at Belgium, actually, is the general spread of everyone after about lap 26. There are no sort of individual pace groups. Everyone is mangled together. And even at the end, we don't even have Lewis Hamilton and Valtteri Bottas and Max Verstappen going quickly. They get lost in the midfield and we actually end up with two different drivers coming through to be the fastest near the end of this race. So it was a bit of an interesting one looking at the data behind Belgium, but still, it was awesome. And then leaving Belgium, we head to Italy and we have a look at their positions chart, a race that was incredibly boring until the red flag. And then after the red flag, it was again incredibly boring. Absolutely nothing happened. We see Lewis Hamilton having to serve his penalty and go all the way to the back and then fighting his way forward. And then equally after the red flag period, we see Kimi Raikkonen fall from P2 all the way down to P13. And that's about it. Other than that, we don't really see anything happen here at all. And if we just have a look at their lap time chart, unfortunately, because I take out all of the all of the times that aren't necessary to my calculations, we have a void and the important void of where all of the stuff happens. But we can sort of see a vague chasm, but it only looks like it's Lewis Hamilton. So if we just zoom in on this, it absolutely is. He is ludicrously quicker than everybody else throughout this Grand Prix. And for the first, uh, what's that, 19 laps up until the red flag period, or just when they started to slow down, he wasn't beaten by anybody. He was the fastest man on track for 20 laps. And then even after the red flag, when he served his penalty, he was still the quickest man on the track and was still poking his head up even through the traffic as well after uh, that penalty and having to come back through everybody. He was still going so, so fast. But unfortunately, I don't have the data for that red flag period as I'm just a bit too lazy to go and get it again. It's a little bit annoying as it would have been cool to see what happened during that red flag transition and all the yellow flag transitions. Sorry. But taking a look at what happened in Tuscany and opening up their positions chart, we see we lose a bunch of people in the early portions of this race because there was that opening lap accident and then there was the safety car restart accident where we lost everybody. And then after that, not a great deal happened until uh, a couple pit stops. But then we have a very interesting foray around lap 43 to 47 with the Williams, Alfa Romeos and the two Ferraris. All sorts of mayhem goes on there. We've got Sebastian Vettel and Charles Leclerc gaining places, losing places. All sorts was going on. Not quite sure what that was. But taking a look at their Tuscany lap time charts as well. Unfortunately, we have that big void for the first 10 laps. And then we also have a small little void as well from laps 42 to 43 or 47 even, which I guess must have been a VSC or possibly a second safety car. But we do have a small little chasm here, which is highlighted by my nice little arrow, which runs near enough until the first safety car line, and then, oh no, just in to the first load of pit stops. And then zooming in on this section, we see that this chasm isn't as big as the one in Spain, or isn't particularly as visible as the one in Spain either, but it is definitely 100% there. And then leaving Tuscany, we head on in to Russia and we have a look at their positions chart. Again, a race that everybody thought was exceptionally boring and not a great deal happened. Not a great deal happened, especially after the first or second round of pit stops. From about lap 31 onwards to the end, people just went backwards and that was about it. I mean, Alex Albon sort of came through the field as well, but that's about it. And then taking a look at the lap time chart for Russia as well, we can see there's a small little void in the opening portion of this race for Carlos Sainz's accident crashing into the first or second corner of chicane little thing. But we do have a first portion of pit stops. We've got a second portion of pit stops as well. Then we have a lone one all the way out here on its end. Then we've got the alternate pit stops as well, which is possibly a VSC 
possibly. I'm not 100% sure, as we do lose the consistency of the rope and there is no straight line going across the bottom. So it's possible that that was actually a VSC. And then we have the fastest lap pit stops right at the very end as well. Now, strangely, in Russia, this was a bit of a chasm that didn't start until about lap 16, which doesn't really follow the trend that we've seen so far this season. But other than just about here, it doesn't really go anywhere. It's not really a strong chasm and it doesn't last very long at all. But just zooming in on that section of racing, you can see it much more clearly here from about laps 13 to, I would say, about 25, maybe 26. There was a big performance gap. Then there was a round of pit stops and then the performance gap came back from around lap 28 to about lap 37. And then other than that, it was just everyone was fighting for everything. And leaving Russia, we head on into Germany and for the Eiffel Grand Prix, and we pull up their positions chart. Now, some of you have already probably noticed the little void that is missing around position 17. Now, for some reason, uh, the API data that I pinched didn't include the positions for Nico Hulkenberg, but we can trace his line along here following the pink arrow. It goes all the way through here, cuts up there, down, wiggles through here, and then plops himself in a nice position eight. Now, I don't know why it didn't have those positions for Nico Hulkenberg, but it does leave a nice little gap so we can easily fill in where he should have been. But then taking a look at the lap time chart for the Eiffel Grand Prix, again, the important bits are missing, that void that I have excluded. Kind of makes this video a little bit eh, because I have excluded those uh, important safety car issues and safety car lines where a lot of the positions end up changing. But 100% we can see a chasm and this one is enormous. This is much, much more visible than the one in Spain and it 100% maybe drops just a little bit between laps 38 and 43, but it lasts near enough the whole of this Grand Prix. And zooming in onto that section, you can see it so, so very clearly here. An absolutely mammoth performance gap between Pretty much just the two, well actually no, Hamilton and Verstappen as Bottas gets lost after the first round of pit stops from laps 18 onwards. It is just Hamilton and Verstappen miles, miles ahead of everybody else. And very interestingly, we end up with a bunch of different groups at the end of the race. We've got group number one, Hamilton and Verstappen. We then have group number two here, which are these four cars. Then we've got a, a third group as well. And then we have the slower groups here. This is what I kind of expect to see in Formula One racing. You see distinct groups forming in this little rope. The rope is what I call the, the big bulk of all the position, uh, all the lap times where it's in that graph. It's just that long line at the bottom. I just like to call it a rope because that's kind of what it looks like. Whereas here in the Eiffel Grand Prix, we end up at the end with definitely two or four distinct groups of lap times. And heading now to the Portuguese Grand Prix, we look at their positions chart. Now this one is a little bit more hectic. A lot more goes on in this one, up until about lap 37, and then not a great deal goes on at all. And if we just have a look at their positions chart, we can see it here. And for once, there are no voids. This is one of the races that there were no voids, no safety cars or VSCs here at all. And if we just highlight the pit stops, we've got two very early ones here. We then have a second group just around here. Then we have a third, fourth and a fifth group of the alternate pit stops and possibly the second pit stops of the green box and then we have the fastest lap pit stops at the very end as well. Now there is a small little chasm if you can see it here it just vaguely vaguely runs pretty much the whole length of this race maybe three quarters of it. I've highlighted the end whereas it is just Lewis Hamilton that pokes down below everybody else but not Valtteri Bottas or Max Verstappen. And then zooming in on that section, we can see it here. So the performance gap definitely lasts between those three cars, Max Verstappen, Lewis Hamilton, and Valtteri Bottas, till around about lap 52, 53. And then it just becomes Lewis Hamilton that maintains that performance gap between everybody else. But unfortunately, there are no distinct groups really visible apart from those top three and everybody else, as they are also very close. And then heading on into the San Marino Grand Prix, we head to their positions chart here. And again, apart from some pit stops around lap 12 and 15, not a great deal happens apart from a few singular pit stops from the Haas, the Williams, the Ferraris, and the Alfa Romeos as well. We have Alex Albon making a late pit stop as well, and that is about it. Not a great deal happens this race. 
And just having a look at their lap time chart, we can see just one little void, but we actually get a lot of the detail that we need here. So we can highlight the first group of pit stops in green, then there's the second group here in blue, then there is another second group here in blue also, with a third group of blue here as well. Then we've got one lone alternate pit stop just before the void, and then we have another fastest lap pit stop right at the end. And then as per usual, here is the chasm for this race, and you can see it lasts until about lap 18 for the three cars, and once again, it just splits off after about lap 18 to just being Lewis Hamilton that leads that charge. And zooming in on that section, you can see it again clearly here. The pace difference is about the same for the two Mercedes and Max Verstappen, lasting around lap 18, and then it is just Lewis Hamilton that manages to carry that forward until the very end. Possibly Verstappen and Bottas hold it until maybe lap 28, you could argue that. And then Verstappen again comes back a little bit at lap 43 to about 51. But other than that, it is definitely Hamilton that carries that gap forwards. And then leaving San Marino and heading to Turkey, the manic, manic race of Turkey. It doesn't look super manic according to the positions chart, or at least as manic as it was on the TV to watch, but definitely in the lap time chart, it is bonkers. And taking a look at that now, we see it here, but it is absolutely skewed by, what's that, almost a four minute lap time from Pierre Gasly, 255 seconds. So if I just chop that off, we can have a look at it just here, and we can see there is all sorts going on. It's not straight, it's all slopey everywhere at the start, it is absolutely ridiculous looking. But we can still highlight some pit stops, there's the first group just around here, there is then a second smaller group just after that, with one lone pit stop on its own just here, but that also could possibly be a mistake from a driver like Valtteri Bottas's spins etc. We've then got a large group in the middle here, with the alternate pit stops on their own, and then we have the final fastest lap pit stop as well. Now here there isn't any particular chasm, especially from the Mercedes and Verstappen trio, but we do have some performance gaps. One here, and one just here at the very end, that last for a few laps. They're not just single lap chasms, they're just small little dots. And then zooming in as best I can on this little section of race, you can see it, mm, I don't know if you can really see it clearly, there's not really much to tell from this race, apart from it was absolutely hectic, and the performance gap is very, very small. There wasn't really any difference between any of the cars in this race. And then into the last trio of races, we head to Bahrain, and we have a look at the Bahrain positions chart. And again, a lot happens at the opening gambit of this race, and then nothing really happens until the first couple of pit stops, then nothing happens until the second couple of pit stops, and then nothing happens again. I feel that is a trend for basically modern day Formula One, unfortunately. But then taking a look at the lap time chart, we do have that void in the first portion of the race and also the last portion of the race as well, but we can still highlight some pit stops here. So we've got the first section in green, we've got a second group in blue, we then have the third alternate pit stops as well, the second or the two stop people, and then we have the fastest lap pit stop here from Mr. Max Verstappen. But again, the chasm has returned and you can see it tracing along here just fine until about the halfway point of this race, around lap 30, 32 sort of region that disappears, and it doesn't really come back until the fastest lap pit stop of Max Verstappen, where he's on fresh tyres and not a lot of fuel, and he manages to pump in those quick lap times. But then zooming in on this section of racing as well, we can see it a little bit more clearly here. We actually have a couple of people in this performance gap, and none of them are Valtteri Bottas. It is Lewis Hamilton, Max Verstappen, Sergio Perez, and also Alex Albon that is in this performance gap, and Valtteri Bottas is lost in the midfield, until around laps 27 to 30, but then he gets lost back in the midfield once again. But then interestingly in Bahrain as well, we see the splitting of this rope as well. We have one group here that ends up finishing, then we've got a middle group of lap times as well, and then just above them here we have the third group. And just like the Eiffel Grand Prix, we have a splitting of the lap times. They split off into nice groups. This is what I expected to see uh, in the racing, and it doesn't actually happen often. It's only really happened twice so far this season. And then heading on into the penultimate Grand Prix, the Sakia race, and we have a look at their positions chart, and unfortunately the uh, x-axis on this graph absolutely hideous, as there were 87 laps, and I've got to try and cram it on onto this one slide here. But again, not a lot happens until the first round of pit stops. A couple bits 
change here and there, but we can see the impact that George Russell had dominating the first portion of the race until the pit stop that went bad. He then fought his way back to second and then had his puncture and then fought his way back to P9. And then taking a look at what that looks like in terms of the lap chart, we can see it here. And again, we do have some voids, unfortunately, but we can still highlight some early pit stops here in green, another group of pit stops here in blue, and some more in yellow, with George Russell popping his head up here for his puncture pit stop, which enabled him to get the fastest lap, but it was technically not a fastest lap pit stop, it was still a puncture pit stop. But we definitely have a small visible chasm here up until the first sort of issues and the first round of pit stops and then it disappears and then it massively comes back for George Russell at the very end of this race and zooming in we can see that so so very clearly it is uh, George Russell and Valtteri Bottas controlling the race and controlling the pace until the first round of pit stops they then get lost in the midfield and don't really come back until George Russell has to pit for a second time as he's got Valtteri Bottas's tyres on. You can see him forming that nice little W shape between Sergio Perez as well. And then he has to pit again for his puncture and then fighting through the field, he is still setting the fastest lap time of this race, even in traffic. And then I've just zoomed in on that last 10 to 15 lap section of the race as well, and we end up with something like this. So George Russell is that blue line, and then we've got Sergio Perez in the darker line as well, and then everybody else is just jumbled in between. And you can see so clearly how much quicker George Russell was going, even in traffic, in the Mercedes that we know isn't good in traffic. He was able to pump in the fastest lap of the race consistently for the last seven laps. And then finally, we have the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix, and their positions chart looks something like this. Now, we've got Max Verstappen, Valtteri Bottas, and Lewis Hamilton all uninterrupted in P1, P2, and P3. One of the most boring-looking positions charts, unfortunately. But if we just take a look at the lap time charts, we've just got one blank period, one void, and that was for the safety car issue as well. We've got one pit stop here, then we've got a second, a third a group of four, and then we have the late pit stop here as well, and then some fastest lap pit stops just at the very end. And we definitely have a chasm here, and this chasm actually ends up including Alex Albon at the very end. But this one runs throughout the whole of the race, near enough until around lap 49. And then just zooming in on this portion of the race as well, you can see it very clearly here. And we actually start off with three different performance gaps, but then they end up merging into one. So this is the opposite of what happened in the Eiffel Grand Prix and also Russia as well. Something that we don't really see this season, but something I expected to see, it's now happening at the start of the race where we've got three distinct bands of racing and they join into one. Whereas before we've seen one band of racing split off into three or four. But interestingly, when we saw that uh, Alex Albon was catching up to Lewis Hamilton, he wasn't even the fastest car on the track. He was only the fastest here on lap 38, here again on lap 42, 45, 47, and also lap 51. On no other occasion was Alex Albon actually the fastest man on the track, which a lot of the commentators were actually saying, which I suppose was true if they said it on those particular laps, but to say that he was the fastest in those last couple... That unfortunately isn't true, but he was definitely faster than Lewis Hamilton as he was able to catch him up. Almost overtake him, not quite. And there we go, that is all of the data covered for this race. That's been, oh Christ, 40 minutes. Jesus, that's going to be fun editing that. Anyways, we will now delve on into my rankings and how I have ranked the 1,975 categories for this performance video. Welcome one and all to those people that have skipped forward ahead of the data little section of this video. The first maybe half an hour of it. Christ, I spoke for ages about all of those races. But anyway, we are delving on into the 1,975 different categories of this video and what make up the final rankings for the race progression category. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to walk through all 1,975 categories. I'm just going to explain how I work them out. So very similarly to the last video in this series, I have got 17 mini categories. Each mini category is each race. And those 17 mini categories for each driver has a rank from 1 through to 20. There are joint ranks. Those joint ranks are then averaged out again to give an overall category for the race progression video. Within each of the 17 mini categories, there are three micro categories. So micro category number one just looks at your standard deviation for your race positions. That's it. It's nice and simple. But micro category number two has a lot more macro categories in it. 
and some of them change. It depends on how many laps I've actually counted, and some of them have the same number of laps that that race has. So let's just delve on into one of those macro categories, and we start with the race data for Austria. This is the lap times for lap number one for each of the drivers, and you can see it here. And the first thing I do for macro category number one is work out the difference to your teammate. So Lewis Hamilton on lap one was 4.173 seconds behind Bottas, and therefore Bottas was 4.173 seconds ahead of Hamilton. The same for Verstappen and Albon, Norris and Sainz, Perez, Stroll, etc, etc, until Russell and Latifi. And then from this difference order, I then give each of the numbers a rank from 1 through 20 for the largest down to the smallest. And here are the ranks for lap number one. Valtteri Bottas is scored first, Lewis Hamilton is scored last, and then we've got Lando Norris in P2, and then Daniel Ricciardo in P3, etc, etc, etc. And this same category is then repeated throughout all of the laps of every single race. And then each of those ranks for however many number of laps are averaged out, and we have an order that looks a bit like this. So the ranking for the micro category number one for Austria has Leclerc at the top, then Perez, Norris, Ricardo, Magnussen, Russell, Hamilton, Bottas, Gasly, Verstappen, and so on and so on and so on. So hopefully that one makes a bit of sense. I will then move on in to micro category number two. Now this one looks at your position. So I have worked out everyone's average positions on any particular lap. So your average position on lap one throughout the whole season, your average position on lap two, lap three, lap four, etc, etc, etc. And I've pulled up a graph that looks a little bit like this. We've got Lewis Hamilton that pops himself just there, and you can see for the first 28 laps, regardless of what Grand Prix it was, he averaged at position 2. He then fell down to position 3 between laps 29 and 33, and then went back to P2 again, and from laps 54 to 69 or 70, he averaged at position 1, and unfortunately for the last 15 laps, he didn't compete in the Sakia Grand Prix, so he doesn't have an average for the last 17 laps of this graph. And then just popping in Valtteri Bottas, we see that he was consistently worse than Lewis Hamilton in average position terms. We can then pop on Max Verstappen and he actually slots in just in between the two Mercedes. And then we can pop on Alex Albon who you can see has a massive performance gap between Max Verstappen and himself as well as the two Mercedes also. And then from there I can just plot on everybody else. So we've got the two McLarens as well, then we've got the two racing points and you can see this graph as well gets very very messy. Here come the two Renaults with Esteban Ocon, then the two Ferraris. And then we have the two uh, Alfa Tories, then we've got the two uh, Alfa Romeo cars, followed by the two Haas cars as well, and then lastly we have the Williams. Now interestingly there is a small little void between position 6 and position 5. No one averaged at P5 or P6 until Sergio Perez and Carlos Sainz as well. And then it just sort of faltered, no one really liked being position 5 in any of the Grand Prix. So then using that graph and the knowledge of where they were on each lap of every single Grand Prix, we delve on in to micro category number two, which is formed of X number of macro categories, depending on how many laps there are. So this is again the position data for Austria. Lap number one, Valtteri Bottas was P1, Verstappen P2, Norris P3, Albon P4, and Hamilton P5. And this number is minus from your average, and then we end up with a difference to your average position on lap one, or lap two, lap three, lap four, etc., whichever lap we are looking at. So Hamilton was three positions behind his average on lap one, whereas Bottas was three positions ahead of his average. Verstappen was one position ahead, Albon was four positions ahead. And then we see that Giovinazzi was actually equal to his average. He was neither a position up nor a position down. And once again, we rank this from the largest to the smallest, and we pull up a rank that looks a little bit like this. Norris was P1, and then we've got Albon P2, Perez P3, all the way down to Ocon in last. And once again, these ranks are worked out every single lap, and then after all of those laps are done, I then rank each and every single, or then average out each and every single one of those ranks, and we pull up an order that looks a little bit like this. Norris P1, then Magnussen, Albon, Stroll, Bottas, Verstappen, Ricardo, Leclerc, etc etc down to Ocon. Now if you're sat there thinking like this is a hell of a lot of work for probably not a lot of gain you would be absolutely right and I'm starting to think that as well just recording this video it's been 45 minutes and I felt like I've got nowhere 
But honestly, it was a hell of a lot of fun. And we have three macro categories, two that look at your individual performances. That's the standard deviation of your uh, positions across the whole race, how consistent you were through that race, your uh, average position comparing to your average position, position, the one we've just looked at. And then we have the one comparing to your teammate, which we looked at very first. So then once the three micro categories are worked out and I have three individual ranks for those micro categories, they can then be averaged out to form the mini category race result for whichever race it is. And then those 17 mini categories get averaged to form the final category. And if I just delve on into this graph here, this shows the positions for each of the mini categories. So Lewis Hamilton for Austria scored a rank of seven. For Styria, it was position one. For Hungary, position four, etc., etc. And he had a dip in Italy, Tuscany, and Russia. And then he came back down in the Eiffel Grand Prix, Portugal, etc., etc. And then mapping on Valtteri Bottas, we can see that he actually scored last place in Turkey and Bahrain as well, according to all of this data. And then we've got Max Verstappen that slots in just below as well. Then we've got Alex Albon that pops in just above all of these also. But interestingly to note, they all faltered at Italy. They all had a peak in Italy compared to any other race. And then filling in everybody else, this one gets very, very, very squiggly. But don't worry, all of these averages or all of these lines get averaged out for each driver. And we will pull up one final graph after this has been completed. We've just got the Alfa Tories to go, then the Alfa Romeos. Then we've got the Haas cars coming through as well of Kevin Magnussen and Roman Grosjean. And then finally, the two Williams cars. And then we end up with something that looks a bit like that, an absolute mess. But don't worry, I can average each of those lines out and we end up with the overall scoring and ranking of today's video that looks a bit like this. Max Verstappen in P1, then Lewis Hamilton, George Russell, then Stroll, Ricardo, Sainz, Magnussen, Leclerc, Gasly, Bottas, Perez, Giovinazzi, Norris, Grosjean, Ocon, Latifi, Albon, Kvyat, Raikkonen and Vettel was last in this video. And there we go, 50 odd minutes as I just punch my shelf of recording to end up with this order 1 through 20 here. So there is just one more video left in this series and that is to collate all four videos performances together and decide who is the best driver of 2020. Now, if you guys have disagreed with anything that I've said, please let me know down in the comments below. If you have any ideas of your own for statistics videos, also let me know in the comments. Or if you have any ideas of how to improve the videography of these videos too, or any improvements to the maths that I could make, that is much, much appreciated. And I will take on board any comments that are left down below. But thank you guys so much for watching and join me in the next episode with whatever and whenever I decide to make it. I'll see you guys then.